Hello, and thank you for joining us tonight for our free webinar, Exploring the Small Intestine CMU Channel, featuring Matt Callison and Brian Lau from the Sports Medicine Acupuncture Certification Program. My name is Jeff Bloom, Education Marketing Manager here at LASA OMS. For over 40 years, LASA OMS has been striving to promote the growth of the acupuncture industry by providing quality products, great prices, and the best customer service, as well as supporting the many schools and continuing education efforts available. With our free webinar series, we intend to provide free educational opportunities taught by some of our industry's most renowned practitioners and educators. I would like to take a moment to acclimate you to the webinar room. To the right of the video screen, you will see three tabs, chat, questions, and polls. To chat with other attendees or to communicate any technical difficulties, please use the chat tab. For questions of our guest speakers, please make sure to use the questions tab so we can see it during the questions and answers, which will be at the end of the lecture. And please note that immediately following each webinar, they are re uh, recorded and you will all receive a link to view the video on demand. You may always visit our blog and use the free webinar tag to find all of our previously recorded events. From sports acupuncture to neuroscience to Chinese herbs, you'll find something interesting for every practitioner on the LASA OMS blog. Now for our featured speakers. Matt Callison's unique ability to blend Chinese medicine with sports medicine for almost 30 years is demonstrated by his excellent reputation. And this is particularly evident in his educational program, the Sports Medicine Acupuncture Certification Program, which is attended by acupuncturists worldwide. He has over 20 years of experience in cadaver dissection that has helped him to further broaden and deepen his educational program for the acupuncturist. And recently, the Sports Medicine Acupuncture Certification Program has released their new Module 3, which is available on lasaoms.com through Net of Knowledge. Um, please check your email after the webinar for a promo code to save on this class. I also would like to introduce Brian Lau, who is a certified in both sports medicine acupuncture and structural integration. He has been on faculty since 2013 with the Sports Medicine Acupuncture Certification Program, where he teaches anatomy and physiology palpation assessment and treatment of the channel sinews, Jing Jin, acupuncture, and myofascial re release techniques. Please join me in welcoming Brian and Matt. Thank, thank you, Jeff. Really appreciate that. Thank you, LASA OMS, for having us. Um, Brian, it's always nice to be able to do this with you again. Um, something that we also need to be able to give credit to Brian is that he is becoming an expert in cadaver dissection. So um, he's been doing this for quite a long time. He actually does also teach at the uh, University of Tampa. Um, the medical students there um, usually uh, usually two weeks in a row. So it's uh, it's pretty great to be able to have him as a co-dissector. He I learn a lot from Brian and what and his views and how he does things. Thanks, so thanks, you're welcome. <laughs> so. <laughs> How we came up with this topic, you guys, which by the way, good evening, good evening everyone. It's uh, what, eight o'clock in the evening on the East Coast. Uh, how we came up with this topic is Brian and I were chatting about the module four neck, shoulder and upper extremity that's in the SMAC program. And that's gonna be released uh, coming up in about a month, maybe about six weeks. However, however, for those people that did take the live webinar, uh, you will have access to that as soon as tomorrow or the next day. So it's going to be released for you guys that already took that live webinar. It'll be for sale on LASA OMS and other strategic partners uh, coming up probably in about six weeks or so. But anyhow, the reason why we got into this is that um, the small intestine sinew channel out of all of the yang channels of the upper extremity, large intestine and sanjiao, it has the most amount of injuries that can take place along the whole course of that sinew channel. And Brian and I were chatting about it. it's really amazing how many injuries can actually take place on that channel compared to the large intestine, the San Zhao. And there's no way we're going to be able to go over every single one mm -hmm. of these injuries in this short hour. Uh, we do go over every single one of these injuries in the SMAC program because we have enough time to be able to do that. But we wanted to emphasize with this is looking at this myofascial sinew channel and how it connects with all of the tissues and what acupuncture points can st we can stimulate that will affect the entire channel. So this is gonna be really quite useful for um, any kind of injuries that you're looking at, for example, supraspinatus tendinopathy or triceps tendinopathy, I mean, there's a whole list of them that we can be able to use key acupuncture points that will actually start to take pain away from that. 
we call this acupuncture as an assessment. So we wanted to actually spend some time getting into that and hopefully we'll give you some really useful tools that you can take back to your clinic and practice them tomorrow. Brian, is there anything that you wanted to say with that or should we just jump right into the next slide? Um, yeah, we can add some stuff as we go. I think we can jump right in. All right, okay. So let's... Uh... All right, hold up just a moment. Having a little technical problem since I don't have it full size, I don't see how to advance the slide. But um, maybe... Brian, you are gonna have to be in the PowerPoint program. Oh, got it, so just, I got it, okay. Perfect. Yep, now, okay, so, uh, just to give a little theory and build this uh, idea of the continuous myofascial plane of the small intestine sinew channel, we could do the same thing for large intestine, urinary bladder, stomach, any of the sinew channels. They all follow really the same basic theme. So let's look at just sort of how they interconnect through the fascia. You know, fascia is such a buzzword these days, um, which uh, has been really building for the last several decades, the importance of it through a lot of different systems out there. Um, so uh, let's look and, and kind of go through just some basic ideas with this. So first of all, these myofascial planes are part of a continuous network uh, of its muscle of the muscles in their fascial layers. So myo, muscle, fascial would be the fascia of the muscles. Uh, so if we start really more cellular and at the small unit, this would include the epimyceum, paramyceum, and endomyceum. So epimyceum is the surrounding the fascial bag the compartment that surrounds an entire muscle. The perimyceum is the bag that surrounds muscle fascicles, uh, bundles of muscle fibers. And the endomyceum is the bagging or the compartment that surrounds each individual muscle fiber. So these images you see on the slide up at the uh, up top right would be the endomyceum. That's well magnified. Uh, the uh, muscle fibers are really not even visible or bare. May maybe if you have extremely good vision and you have a high contrast background, maybe vis visible with the naked eye, but it's you know pretty pretty small. So this is obviously a, a um, magnified view of it, but it's showing the the endomyceum, the compartments that surround each individual muscle fiber. So if you look at each of those little honeycomb compartments, those would contain a muscle fiber. So then if we zoom out a little bit for the bottom image, we're seeing a muscle fascicle. So a bundle of 100, 200 or so muscle fibers. And again, that's magnified, but it gives you a picture of that fascia layer that surrounds and creates a compartment for those bundles of muscle fibers. If we had a third image here, we would have to zoom out even further and see 100 or 200 or so of these muscle fascicles all bundled together with a compartment that surrounds those, which would be the epimyceum. So those are the fascial layers that surround the muscle. They create compartment, they create organization of the muscle fibers, bundles of muscle fibers in the muscle itself. So how does that work for the myofascial plane? Then is that as the muscle comes towards the bone, so if we look at tendon A, let's call that muscle A, um, that could be the flexor carpial narrus if we're talking about the small intestine sinew channel. It could be one of the muscles along the small intestine sinew channel. As the muscle tissue ends, those fascial compartments continue and become the tendon. So the tendon is really just a continuation of those fascial compartments, the epimyceum, paramyceum, and endomyceum. Um, so from one end of the tendon to the next, all continuous through those fascial layers through the muscle, those then approach the bone, and those fascial compartments then blend in with the periosteum. Um, and that's how a muscle quote unquote attaches to a bone. It's just the fascial layers blend from the tendon A in this case into the uh, attachment, into the periosteum. Some of those fascial fibers penetrate deeper into the bone. But if you look at this image, what you're seeing is also some of those fascial fibers from tendon A blend with some of those fascial fibers from tendon B. So I could go and I could cut down to the bone at that junction between you know, where tendon A attaches and cut the muscle away if I was gonna in dissection resect a muscle away from the bone. But we could also take a different strategy and get that blade kind of parallel to the bone and tease the connections of tendon A and tendon B from the bone, but keep the fascial interconnections. And now we would have a continuous structure, you know, where one muscle is still connected 
to the next muscle that's just removed from the bone. So this would be building the fascial plane. This could be, as we're going to look at the small intestine sinew channel, this could be flexor carpi ulnaris and the anconius muscle, and then into the triceps, and then into the next muscle along the chain. So it's creating a continuous fascial plane. So, yeah, go ahead, Matt. Can I say Absolutely. Uh -huh. um, just another example uh, for this one. Um, so in the small intestine sinew channel, a good example of this would be supraspinatus as it attaches to the supraspinous fossa in small intestine 13 region mm -hmm. and how the supraspinatus interdigitates with the levator scapula as if it's one muscle. Um, pretty fascinating to see. What you will see, what Brian just mentioned was the flexor carpi ulnaris and the anconius. This is a really a fascinating one because between the two soft tissues, the flexor carpi ulnaris, and on the other side of the ulna is the anconius that there is a connection between flexor carpi ulnaris that crosses over the bone actually mm -hmm. into the anconia. So we'll have a video of that so you can see the force transmission, mm -hmm. which is really kind of nice because it gives you a point combination to use with certain types of injuries. So that's coming. Yeah. All right. So these are sometimes referred to as myofascial, uh, myofascial planes are sometimes referred to as myofascial meridians. You'll see that language out there, um, not necessarily, or I, I shouldn't even say not necessarily. This isn't indicating meridians in the Chinese medical you know, channel uh, description of them. Meridians in this case is more like lines, you know, like uh, longitude and latitude and like lines uh, in that, that way are referred to as meridians. So these are uh, myofascial planes, myofascial, continuous myofascial planes that some in some circles, even outside of Chinese medicine, they call them myofascial meridians. You see that with uh, Tom Meyer's work uh, who wrote Anatomy Trains. Um, that's really one of the probably bigger sources out there right now. Um, again, it's not looking at it from a Chinese medicine standpoint. However, there's a lot of information from these myofascial meridians, these anatomy trains um, that, uh, that can inform the work we do because they go into a lot of depth on the anatomy and it kind of helps us kind of look back at that the descriptions of the sinew channels and fill in some of the blanks, especially if you're looking at it from the lens of Chinese medicine. So it's a really good explanation for the, the, the sinew channels or the Jing Jin, um, kind of an evolution that helps us evolve that work even more. So this image is showing from anatomy trains are showing two things on the, on the right side, which is not the subject of the day, on the right side is what they call the superficial back arm line. So that's going up through the arm. I'm not gonna cover each, each structure, but it goes into the lower, middle, and upper traps. If we were to take that away, that superficial back arm line, what you're seeing on the left-hand part of that image is the deep back arm line. And that's relatively close to the small intestine sinew channel. It covers some of the rotator cuff muscles, levator scapula that Matt just mentioned, uh, it has the triceps, um, it kind of follows the topography of the small intestine sinew channel. So the Anatomy Trains book is an excellent book, and, and I think Tom Myers has done some, some really fantastic uh, game changer work with it. However, he's coming from a different viewpoint. He's a structural integration practitioner, some of the work that I did in the past and still do, but um, they're using hands and elbows and you know manual therapy to work with these planes, not, not a fine acupuncture needle, but, you know, a little bit bigger of a structure. Um, so, you know, it's a different tool and a different paradigm. Um, so they don't have to have it match so much the uh, channel system that we know. And uh, to give you an idea of what I'm getting at is there's two of their arm lines, the superficial back arm line and the deep back arm line. They have two more. They have a superficial front arm line and deep front arm line. So two front arm lines, which cover, you know, into the pectoralis major and into the front of the body, superficial and a deep, and then two back arm lines, a superficial and a deep. So if we were to try to use that for our work, it'd be great if all you're doing is needling trigger points. You know, it doesn't really matter if you're calling it a channel or individual muscle or whatever, if you're needling trigger point of the upper traps, you're needling trigger point of the upper traps, or if you're needling motor points, and that's what you do is, is do needle motor points, which we do, and Matt really is one of the pioneers of, of motor point work in, in the acupuncture field. But if all we did was needle a motor point, and, and that, that was the end of the story, just needle a motor point for anterior deltoid pain, you needle an anterior deltoid motor point, then it doesn't really matter the specificity of the channel. But if you were to go and use these anatomy trained channels, there's only four channels. Well, we have six 
channels in the arm uh, for Chinese medicine. So, so somewhere in this, in their view, it doesn't really match our view. And um, we need a system that is a little bit more specific for acupuncturists. And I'm not uh, saying that to take away from the work that Tom Myers has done. Again, it's a different paradigm. It works for their system. But I think for our system, we can be informed from his work and informed from other work that's out there but make it a little bit more specific and a little bit more usable for acupuncture so we can start to combine it more specifically with distal points, local points, adjacent points, and create a much more comprehensive uh, picture. Matt, anything you want to add to that? No, that was great what you just said. So this, uh, I'm going to go back for a second. This is looking at the myofascial plane, one muscle in, shares fascia with a next muscle on that same depth in the same plane and creating sort of a longitudinal myofascial plane. But we do see examples, uh, not so much with the small intestine sinew channel, um, but in other channels where there's fascial expansions that might link a, a more superficial muscle with a deeper muscle. And th I guess this is kind of related to small intestine channel in this image, because what we're seeing is the triceps and the latissimus dorsi. So the latissimus dorsi is marked there. This is from the fascial atlas, uh, functional atlas of the human body from Carlos Deco, an excellent uh, anatomical atlas that shows a lot of fascial connections. They're showing the lats, which you can kind of see on the bottom left of the picture. If we were to follow the lats and really do a, a full dissection there and follow it to its attachment, that's gonna go to the front of the arm to the um, medial lip of the bicipital uh, groove. So it's gonna go to the front of the arm. But you can see this big kind of glob of fascia, so to speak, that's um, kind of right in the middle. There's a line coming up right from the bottom middle of the picture and pointing to it. So that fascial expansion links, even though this isn't an anatomy text in terms of attachments, it links the latissimus dorsi to the lats, which should be very important for things like walking, uh, you know, whether running or something like that, where one arm is swinging and uh, in opposite direction is the other arm. So it would link that arm movement with the lats down into the back, down towards the opposite side of the glute. Very important for a lot of movement. But in this case, that would also link the um, small intestine and the urinary bladder sinew channels. So it helped coordinate that movement from one channel to the next in these really highly related channels. So sometimes we'll see these examples of these fascial expansions that, that create connections in the channels also. Could I add something with that? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you guys, so the, the triceps, even though it's on the San Jiao primary channel, we're linking it with the small intestine sinew channel because that's the bag that it fits in. So the triceps uh, being associated with the small intestine sinew channel, as Brian was talking about, you see that fascial expansion going into the latissimus and what he was saying. I just want to make sure to reiterate this because what he said was really important is that you're now linking the small intestine with the UB, which is your mm -hmm. tai yang. So, in addition, there's been a lot of research with fascia. I mean, it's just exploding, as Brian was saying. It started 15 years ago, and now it's just there's research all over the place. But these fascial expansions are highly proprioceptive. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of proprioceptors within these fascial expansions in order to be able to communicate to the central nervous system about what's happening with this area of tissue. Um, there's another really fantastic myofascial expansion that we talk about in module two that's underneath the glute maximus and mm -hmm. it attaches to the hamstrings and how important it is to be able to address that tissue. It's right by UB36, but it's actually really quite big like how you see in this image. Mm -hmm. And uh, working with that tissue changes hamstring strain, sciatica changes lower glute maximus strain because you're, you're changing the communication by opening up these, these mild fascial expansions. It's fantastic. It's yeah. Fun. Helping the glute max communicate better with the hamstrings so they can mm -hmm. coordinate activity, which is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting about the uh, San Jiao channel, Matt, in terms of, uh, I would agree that it does run through the triceps, and we'll talk about that in a second when we look at the tissues associated with the small intestine channel, but this SI channel would run through that, even though it doesn't have any uh, points along that that uh, topography, along the triceps, but it would still also run through that area. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's look at a similar image. This is one that I created with some 3D software and um, looks kind of similar to that one we saw with anatomy trains, but it's going to be a little bit more specific for our medicine. Um, so this would be the tissues that we have associated with the small intestine sinew channel. So we can kind of go through them briefly. There's going to be a few key structures that we look at in this uh, particular 
uh, seminar, but let's kind of go through the whole thing. So from the distal end, we have the abductor digiti minimi. Abductor digiti minimi kind of spans that SI3 to SI4 region. We'll talk about the motor point in a little bit, uh, halfway between SI3 and SI4, but that muscle on that hypothenar part of the hand. So abductor digiti minimi, really a great muscle. We'll get more into this one. Flexor carpi ulnaris and the ulnar head. We'll get more into this one, but I'll talk about the ulnar head real briefly now. And you'll see this in the, the video coming up is the ulnar, the flexor carpi ulnaris has two heads and it has a head that attaches to the ulna itself. And then it has a head that attaches to the medial epicondyle. So it's kind of an interesting muscle in that it's sort of shared between the heart and the small intestine sinew channel. We're gonna follow the track that goes through the ulnar head because that links then with the next muscle, the anconius, a little small muscle, we'll go into that in a little bit, into the triceps, but really the two more superficial triceps, which are the long head and the lateral head. If I were to remove those two superficial triceps, there's gonna be a deeper tricep uh, which is the medial head, which is part of the San Jiao sinew channel. So the more superficial hamstrings are going to be more continuous with this plane we're talking about. Uh, into the rotator cuff muscles, uh, especially the posterior ones, infraspinatus, teres minor, supraspinatus, subscap is part of the heart sinew channel. That's going to be in a different plane. Then as Matt talked about from supraspinatus, you have a really great link into levator scapula all the way up to the uh, um, atlas and uh, you know C1, C2 region, uh, which maybe gives us some information of why SI3 can be such an important muscle or such an important point to regulate the do channel because this whole sinew channel really has a lot to do with that balance of uh, um, C1 on the occiput and, and C1 on C2. And then into some other muscles, which I'm not gonna get into so much today uh, that go up into the face region. So that is your small intestine sin sinew channel. We'll focus on a few key structures in this today. Matt, I think you're gonna take it. Anything you want to say about that before we move on? Uh, just to reiterate that this is a continuous myofascial connection. Like you were mm -hmm. saying, the abductor digiti minimi attaches then to pisiform bone and so does the flexor carpi ulnaris. So they interdigitate. Mm -hmm. um, going up in the triceps, a uh, long head goes into that lateral aspect of the scapula, so therefore it blends in with the infraspinatus teres minor, mm -hmm. and then that goes into supraspinatus levator scapula. So again, it's just that myofascial connection that is communicating distal, local, and adjacent, and why acupuncture can work so well with using certain points to be able to affect something distal. And again, just credit to our founding forefathers that actually figured this out thousands of years ago. We're just describing it in a different language right now. Mm -hmm. I think we have the cadaver warning image that's next, right? Yeah, yeah. This is something that we do just as a practice, everybody, because we do have quite a few cadaver images in our, our um, education. So let's make sure we don't know where you are at the moment. If you're in a coffee shop and there are people behind you, because that's actually opening up for a lot of states, which mm -hmm. is really yeah, great. It is. <laughs> right. So we want to make sure that uh, people looking over your shoulder at your what you're looking at is not going to be grossed out or offended or anything Disturbed. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So please, no screenshots of this. Don't record anything. Um, no downloading. We're not going to share this. We want to make sure that this education stays um, in its proper place, if mm -hmm. you would, please. So thank you very much for that. Um, should we go right into, maybe we should set up this yeah. video. Mm -hmm. So what you're going to be looking at is a lateral view of the arm. You'll see the flexor carpi ulnaris, and you'll see the ulna. You will also see the anconius. There's going to be a needle at the flexor carpi ulnaris motor entry point, and there's also a needle in the anconius. Now, if you wanted to do this on yourself, take your finger on small intestine eight. If you go distal about three and a half, four soon, in this region will be the flexor carpi ulnaris. All right, so there's going to be a needle in this region of the motor entry point for the flexor carpi ulnaris. Now, if you take your finger and direct it toward the bone, that's all ulna right there. Now, the anconius is going to be right very close to the medial epicondyle. So the small intestine sinew channel is going from flexor carpi ulnaris over into the anconius. So what you'll see is pulling on one needle, and you'll see the other needle move 
to be able to prove the force transmission and the communication between these two muscles. And again, this can be useful point prescription using flexor carpi ulnaris and anconius for lateral elbow pain in addition to medial elbow mm -hmm. pain, that point combination. All right, so Jeffrey, can we go for it? We're looking at the posterior lateral aspect of the upper arm, the elbow, and the forearm. Here's the triceps. There's the olecranon. Here we have the lateral epicondyle. Here we have the ulna going up, and then up to the wrist. This needle right here is in the anconius. The anconius is an extension of the triceps as an elbow extensor. This needle is in the flexor carpi ulnaris, the ulnar head. We're looking at the triceps, the anconius, and the flexor carpi ulnaris belonging to the small intestine gingin. The triceps, the myofascia, comes around, past the olecranon, fascially connects to the anconius, even though this is the Sanjiao primary channel. We're putting this into the small intestine gingin. So the anconius in that myofascial tissue goes up and over the bone into the ulnar head of the flexor carpi ulnaris and continues down towards the wrist, the distal part of the wrist. That would be part of the small intestine gingin. We have a needle in the anconius. We have a needle into the motor entry point of the flexor carpi ulnaris. So what we're doing here is to twist the needle of the flexor carpi ulnaris. Twist the needle of the flexor carpi ulnaris there. Wrap that tissue around as much as possible. And we'll pull try to create a force transmission and we can see that that anconius is also moving showing that there is a force transmission between these two tissues so therefore by needling these two points would be very useful any kind of uh, trauma that's including these muscles for example um, ulnar nerve entrapment in the flexor carpi ulnaris needling the anconius would be useful for that or an anconius strain would be useful to go ahead and treat the flexor carpi ulnaris motor point You can really see that moving quite a bit here. All right. All right, so we'll go to the next slide. All right, so Brian, let's get into the functional anatomy associated with the SI sinew channel. There's a number of different things to be able to talk about, but again, we, this could go all day um, or all night, which would be a lot of fun because there's a lot of fun things to be able to talk about, but we got to keep within this hour, hopefully. So with shoulder external rotation, so we look at the muscles that are going to be associated with shoulder external rotation. So infraspinatus, teres minor, posterior deltoid also does, but we're putting that more into the large intestine sinew channel. Um, Supraspinous, some of the fibers there also assist with external rotation. That would be your small intestine sinew channel. So supraspinatus, teres minor, and your infraspinatus into shoulder external rotation. Now that's going to be linking with shoulder internal rotation in a Biao-Li relationship. Small intestine for shoulder external rotation and heart for shoulder internal rotation. The heart tissues would be your subscapularis, a very powerful shoulder internal rotator, and then also the pectoralis uh, major being associated with the heart as well. So those two are going to be linking. Um, let's see, as far as shoulder abduction links with opposite hip abduction, this is something that I've been teaching for probably a good 20, 25 years or so. When somebody's having difficulty with shoulder abduction, for example, like a painful arc, let's say, where the supraspinatus is contracting. That shoulder abduction is going to be neurologically linked with the opposite hip adduction. So adduction, adduction, excuse me. So you have shoulder abduction, you have hip adduction. That's better. Now, with supraspinatus being small intestine, then your adductors being associated with liver. So there's your midday and midnight correlation. So we can be able to address 
your sheet cleft and luo points as well as motor points for each one of these tissues in order to affect that painful arc or an adductor strain. So if somebody has an adductor strain, we could also go ahead and treat the supraspinatus because of the effect that it has on that midday, midnight relationship and how it's neurologically linked. Now this is something that we've been playing around with a little bit, something for you to try, okay? So we don't have enough clinical experience to be able to say this works. Whereas the first two bu bullets, those work fantastic. That's almost guaranteed by needling these points, you can be able to change the posture, the muscle, manual muscle testing, and also pain. This particular one, give this one a go. Let's say that you're treating somebody with chronic ankle instability, and they're going into ankle eversion, so they're contracting the peroneals, or maybe they're passively going into uh, ankle inversion, so lengthening the peroneals. We're categorizing the peroneals in the urinary bladder sinew channel. So therefore, if there's any kind of pain or discomfort with this ankle sprain or chronic ankle sprain with the peroneal lengthening or shortening, try needling the flexor carpi on the motor point on the opposite side, and then go ahead and retest and see if that pain and discomfort is better. So um, give that a go. We'd be we're super happy to be able to hear from what your results are with this. Um, this is going to be another one of those mirror imaging techniques with it, and there's lots of them out there, but this one has um, a lot of positive results with it. So mm -hmm. give that one a try. Brian, is there anything you want to add to that before we go to the next one? Yeah, without getting too uh, off topic, because we're talking about the SI Sydney channel, Jing Jin. Um, some of you might be going, wait a minute, peroneals, how would that, that, that seems so obvious that that's a gallbladder Sydney channel muscle. And in the earlier work that we were doing with this, we did have it in the in the gallbladder sinew channel. Clinically, it doesn't relate as much. So a couple of things just to glance at without me going on too much of a um, uh, tangent on this is if you go back and even just look at like a Deadman, which isn't showing muscle specific anatomy, they're showing topography. You'll see that the urinary bladder does have a lateral branch that and, and the classics and the, and the Ling Shu, it describes that lateral branch is going behind the, the lateral malleolus. They don't call it the lateral malleolus, obviously, but they're going behind the lateral malleolus where the gallbladder sinew channel goes in front of it. And the peroneals really match that UB uh, lateral branch. So the UB sinew channel includes gastrocnemius, um, which would kind of seem more obvious for a UB distribution, but there is this lateral branch that deviates from the pri uh, primary channel that in my opinion, goes just behind, just posterior, pretty close to, but just posterior to the gallbladder sinew channel. Um, so the gallbladder sinew channel then would be in front of the fibula. Um, so yeah, just check check that out in Deadman to review that and you'll see what I'm talking about with that lateral branch. Can but um, sure, absolutely. Okay, um, just to be able to prove this hypothesis mm -hmm. that we had with this is that what we did is on a cadaver specimen, we did another needle force transmission test. Mm -hmm. So we put a needle into the biceps femoris, and the biceps femoris being the lateral hamstring. Mm -hmm. That attaches to the fibular head, and so does the peroneus longus. So we put a needle into the biceps femoris, we put a needle into the peroneus longus, and then we put a needle into gallbladder 34, so that was our test needle. When we pulled the biceps femoris through forced transmission, the peroneus longus needle moved. So those two are connected. So biceps femoris being urinary bladder sinew channel. Peroneus, because it's connected, seems like it's gonna be urinary bladder sinew channel. Gallbladder 34 needle did not move. So for us, that really ironed it out. That, that was conclusive that the peroneus longus and brevis belong more to the urinary bladder sinew channel. And since that discovery, using it for pain syndromes like uh, sacroiliac joint pain, it works remarkable for low back pain and things like that. So that's something to put in your back pocket. We better get back to the small intestine in your channel. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sorry for coming <laughs> on that tangent. There, but that's... All right, let me pull back up the presentation. All right. All right, so we've got a number of different um, images here. These are orthopedic examinations, basically, for different injuries uh, for the small intestine sinew channel. Like for example, we can use the infraspinatus manual muscle test to see if that pain around small intestine 10 region, part of that small intestine sinew channel is part of the infraspinatus that's doing that. So 
Um, infraspinatus manual muscle test is really quite useful. Supraspinatus manual muscle test is useful to be able to see the contractile ability of that supraspinatus mm -hmm. and why it might be leading to pain and dysfunction. Also, very simple test, the external rotator shortness test and the internal rotator shortness test. This is looking at the relationship, the Biao-Li relationship between heart and small intestine, the shoulder external rotators and the shoulder internal rotators. So if you look at that, uh, the middle image at top A, the model is going into internal rotation and the practitioner will put their hand right onto the top of the shoulder there around the Jian Mei Ling region now, as that arm starts to drop farther into, into rotation, that what you're looking at is that that shoulder starts to raise up, then that's going to end up being external rotator shortness test. So that means that your external rotators, for example, your teres minor and your infraspinatus, could be in a shortened position and causing some of the pain and dysfunction. Whereas your internal rotator shortness test, this is primarily looking at the lateral fibers, the pectoralis major, and also the subscapularis. In image A, this is normal range of motion when the patient is at 90 degrees of shoulder abduction and the arm just goes right back. So it's also 90 degrees of elbow flexion. The arm goes right back. That's normal range of motion. When the arm becomes limited, then you will have locked short muscles of the subscapularis and usually those lateral fibers of the pectoralis major. Many times when you do have a um, a positive internal rotator shortness test or external rotator shortness test, the head of the humerus is often going to be forward and superior. So that's going to also have to be addressed as well with this. All right, so should we go to the next slide or you want to say anything? Uh, nope. Nah, next slide. All right, this medial epicondylitis test, these are really quite useful. Now, obviously, it is for medial epicondylitis, but as Brian was saying, the flexor carpi ulnaris in this case, if we're going to be talking about the SI uh, sinew channel and the flexor carpi ulnaris, the humeral head is going to be more of heart, whereas the um, ulnar head is going to be for more for small intestine. Now, just by performing this test, you might be able to pick up also tension within the flexor carpi ulnaris, or maybe some numbness and tingling because of all the nerve entrapment at the cubital tunnel. So these are useful tests to be able to see the function of what's happening with the SI sinew channel. Elbow flexion test, this is another one for our ulnar nerve entrapment cubital tunnel. And also we can use flexor carpi ulnaris manual muscle test to see if we can provoke mm -hmm. any pain within the muscle itself or maybe at the medial epicondyle or anywhere, even on the distal wrist if it's gonna be a tenosynovitis. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, just to add something to this real quick, Matt, um, is it, Anconius itself might also cause lateral elbow uh, pain, but that would be really probably picked up more with palpation, maybe with a uh, triceps manual muscle test just because um, it's an extensor also. But, um, but that one, we didn't list anything for that just because uh, it's um, – in terms of testing, it's more ruling things out, but palpation might might pick up uh, Anconia strain, also, which would could could be uh, something that seems like lateral epicondylitis um, if you're not careful. Uh, it's it's one that kind of mimics lateral epicondylitis or has a very similar pain pattern. So these are just a few of the orthopedic examinations mm -hmm. that can be used uh, to detect where the pain is coming from. Um, let's get into observation of posture. Oops, this is wrong some direction, sorry. There we go. All right, this is something to take a look at with your patients that's going to indicate a levator scapula shortening. With a levator scapula muscle that's going to be in a shortened position can cause lots of different types of injuries. It can contribute to it. It can create them. So in this particular image on the right, you can see that the scapula is elevated compared to the left. You can also see just a little bit of cervical lateral flexion to the right. Now look at the image to the left. This is the levator scapula where it attaches to the superior medial border of the scapula. Then you have your muscle belly as we're going up. And then it goes into these four slips attaching to the transverse process of C1, C2, C3, and C4. So when you have a contraction of the levator scapula, it will laterally flex or laterally bend the head to the same side. It will also assist with cervical rotation to the same side. In addition, 
it will lift the scapula upward with a propensity for the scapula to then downwardly rotate. So with your patient, you're looking for any of those and a combination of that. So you could find cervical lateral flexion, which you can see on this individual on the right, his right ear is slightly lower than his left. And the scapula, the small intestine 13 region is higher than the other. So we can assume, we can hypothesize here that the levator scapula is gonna be in a shortened position. Now with other patients, you can start to see where that scapula starts to downwardly rotate too. That would be another indication for a levator scapula shortening. So what we've just gone over, some orthopedic examinations for different injuries. Um, this is not how to do these examinations. This is just more of a 30,000 foot view, you guys, to be able to support this connection of the SI sinew channel. But um, also this postural sign, levator scapula shortening. Take a look at this one because we're going to show you a couple of points that are going to be very, very useful to help to release this muscle and the myofascial sinew channel. Brian, anything you want to say? Yeah, just a simple thing. Um, all of these tests, as Matt mentioned, um, postural assessment and manual muscle tests and orthopedic tests, uh, we didn't go into a lot of detail because it's a webinar. We don't really have the time for it. We are going to talk about some key things, but um, it, it use the, the 30,000 foot view uh, 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 thought on that. But I would like to add that it is kind of nice because any of these kind of more Western tests now that we've highlighted the structures of the small intestine sinew channel now become channel tests. And we're testing the channel. We're testing does the, the certain structures within that small intestine channel lock on when we're doing a manual muscle test? Is there enough chi in the channel? Do we need to build chi along that channel? Or is there obstruction in the channel that's causing pain that we can pick up with a, with a particular orthopedic test? Mm -hmm. So it takes these Western tests um, and kind of puts them in our bag as now a, a, a way of testing the channels in the same way that we might use palpation and tongue and pulse and other things. That's an excellent segue, Brian. So like what Brian was saying is that if you have a deficiency within that channel, why don't we use small intestine four to be able to help nourish that channel? Mm -hmm. If there's going to be chi and blood stagnation within that channel, we could use classically your team well, your she cleft point, your luo point, uh, motor points also help mm -hmm. to regulate the flow of chi. So um, that's a really nice segue for the next slide. Yeah, Brian, do you want to take it away? Um. Yeah, so we've been working, uh, and we teach this a lot in, in the program, specifically in the assessment and treatment of the channel sinews program uh, uh, class, which uh, in that class in the program, we're looking at the sinew channels, and we're looking a little bit more at functional tests. By that, functional tests aren't necessarily testing for an injury. Um, so manual muscle tests could often be considered a functional test, though you can use those to get a muscle to fire to see if that's the pain generator. But sometimes you're just testing that manual muscle test to see if that muscle has the integrity to do its job, if it's able to lock on. So that's very much a functional test. There's other tests, range of motion. Range of motion would be functional tests. Um, so really uh, any functional test, we teach that uh, more in the assessment and treatment of the channel sinew. Uh, but this idea of acupuncture as assessment could be used really with orthopedic tests, which are testing for injuries for really anything. And the idea is that you could do the test to establish, you know, if, if something is causing pain or if something is causing a dysfunction of some sort, um, limited range of motion, muscle not locking on, whatever the case is, and then pick a point along the channel. It can be uh, particular acupuncture points, uh, like Matt was mentioning, uh, little connecting points, cheek cleft points, source points. Um, we could also consider uh, motor points. Some motor points happen to be acupuncture points. Others are extra points, or maybe they're not defined as an extra point in the Chinese medical literature. Um, so depending on what they are, it doesn't really matter. We can use um, um, uh, motor point also, and we're using those to see if it changes the test. So let's say we do an infraspinatus manual muscle test, and there's just no ability for that muscle to lock on. It doesn't, doesn't have a lot of integrity. Uh, maybe that's leading to um, a potential portion of what's causing the shoulder pain for somebody because the joint's unstable. Well, if there's not a lot of integrity in that muscle, if there's not a lot of chi for that muscle, we might pick something like SI4 to build chi and put the point in, stimulate it while the needle's still in. We might have to back it out a little bit to redo the test, or maybe for that particular one, we probably wouldn't have to retest and see, does, does that change the, the manual muscle test? Is that 
have a different feeling when we do it, you know, that maybe the muscles much uh, more easily uh, is, is has a much easier time locking on. Oftentimes the patients will feel it in that case too. Yeah, I really feel like I can, I have a little bit more strength in that muscle. So it's giving us an indication that yes, the SI channel is involved or the, the, the sinew channel, you know, that network is involved and that particular point has a um, ability to change it. It's not the only point we're gonna use, but we know when we go to form our full treatment, you know, in this case, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll be using uh, infraspinatus uh, motor points, but we could also reinsert uh, SI4 because we saw that there was uh, a change by using that point. Or if we used a sheet cleft point or whatever point we used, it's giving us uh, mo you know, instant information that that is having an effect on the channel. Can we do another example? Sure. Let's say that somebody has triceps tendinopathy around Sanjiao 10 and mm -hmm. you palpate it and you're, you're assuming that's going to end up being tricep tendinopathy. Maybe they were getting ready because summertime is around the corner and they're doing a whole bunch of push-ups and mm -hmm. they strain themselves, right? So this person comes in to see you and you're wondering, okay, well, I just saw this webinar and the triceps are San Jiao, but it's also a small intestine sinew channel. So what you could do then is a manual muscle test of the triceps and see if you can provoke the pain. Once you provoke the pain, then let's do a little experiment. You could take a needle and put it into San Jiao 1, Ching Well Point, and then reassess that test. Did it markedly reduce the pain? Mm -hmm. If it didn't, Try small intestine one or one of our favorites, abductor digiti minimi that we're going to be discussing here in just a tick and see if that reduced the pain. And that tells you as a practitioner that the stagnation is going to be more in the small intestine channel versus the San Jiao or the San Jiao channel versus the small intestine, mm -hmm. which then you can actually add more points. So acupuncture as an assessment is really very, very useful. And this is not something that... Um, that, I mean, this has been going on for thousands of years, and I'm sure that a barefoot doctor had somebody come over and they couldn't bend over very well, and they went ahead and needled some distal point or some other point. Okay, can you bend over now? So they were doing the same thing. We're just putting it into a nice linear fashion, and it's something that I think should be practiced quite a bit because it helps to build your successful treatment protocol. Patients like it too because they're like, wow, I really feel the difference. Wow, one needle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Go for it, B. All right. So uh, these are going to be um, points that we're going to highlight for this uh, particular webinar. Not to say that SI3 is a great point, obviously. SI4, we use all of those um, uh, in, in the uh, acupuncture assessment and for various other reasons, of course. But um, we're going to uh, highlight abductor digiti minimi and flexor carpial naris. Uh, motor points because those also are, are really exceptional points both for local treatments when indicated but also as a sort of a, a distal point that you can use for problems along the sinew channel for the small intestine sinew channel. And adductor digiti minimi uh, attaches really right into the flexor carpial naris um, tendon. So the, they connect through the pisiform bone uh, the, the pisiform bone, you know, you can kind of move and wiggle around like your kneecap because it's a sesamoid bone. Sesamoid bone means it's wrapped in tendon and it's wrapped in the tendon of the flexor carpial naris, which then goes seamlessly into abductor digiti minimi. This particular one isn't this cool uh, myofascial plane connection. Um, this one is if you just look at a regular anatomy text, you'll see that, you know, look up ab abductor digiti minimi and will often be discussed as, as attaching to the tendon. Uh, of flexor carpial naris. So this one is a really strong connection. Um, all of them are strong connections, but this one's a super obvious one. Um, so we're starting to build that channel from the distal portion uh, going up. And these are two really highly uh, effective points to regulate the tension in the, in the um, sinew channel for the small intestine sinew channel. Matt, anything to add? Are you ready to? Uh, no, next slide shows the location of it, I believe. Yeah, for ad starting with abductor digiti minimi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, you can see it on the right-hand portion of the image uh, on the little finger side, SI side. It's halfway between SI4 and SI3. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, a, it's in that SI4, SI3 region, halfway between, right into the muscle belly. Um, 
usually not so deep. What would you say, Matt, about it's pretty superficial usually because that's such a superficial area, about a half, uh, like a one inch needle would be effective for it. I usually use a one and a half just because that's my go-to needle, but I don't go that far with it. Mm -hmm. Half inch about would be pretty typical for that muscle. Yeah, no more than a half an inch. And just mm -hmm. be mindful here, you guys, too, is that the abductor digitum minimi is if, if you can look at it or feel yourself halfway between small intestine three and small mm -hmm. intestine four, you want to go into the muscle belly that Brian was just saying. Now, small intestine three and small intestine four is tucked in under the bone. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to go halfway between three and four and tuck underneath the bone. You're going to miss that innervation site. So you want to go slightly more to the palmar side, and you can just feel when you abduct that digity the pinky, you can feel it pop up. Excellent point. We use it a lot for medial elbow pain, but we're inviting you to use this um, for any acupuncture in this, as an assessment uh, for any pain or dysfunction that's mm -hmm. happening with a small intestine sinew channel. It's one of those go-to muscles, go-to yeah. points. Yeah. So you, you could also consider, you know, with palpation here, you know, if you're palpating that region, maybe you're thinking about using the abductor digitime into my motor point. And it just feels like it's hollow and, and kind of flaccid. And there's, you know, sometimes you feel that that portion of the channel and there's just no tone. It just feels very weak and 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 soft. You know, for me, I might start thinking, you know, maybe I'll maybe I'll go with SI4 and try to sort of build chi in the channel. You know, whereas another person, I might feel that and it just feels dense and hard and like, you know, just like it's right there, you know. Um, so so the palpation can um, can really inform your thought process on this. It's not to say for that flaccid kind of weaker situation, I would never use abductor digit I minimi, but I'm just saying, you know, the thought process of how you're bringing all this information together, the palpation can, can kind of start to give you some, some clinical uh, insight also. Okay. Why don't you grab this one, Matt? Oh, sure. This is a triple star, maybe quadruple star point flexor carpi ulnaris motor entry point located three and a half to four soon down from small intestine eight um, this point i was using actually on a patient for cubital tunnel syndrome decades ago this was a while ago and the cubital tunnel syndrome we were treating that for a number of different visits and i kept on treating this point but then what the patient said is that their shoulder pain was actually getting substantially better as well. When I asked, well, you didn't tell me about the shoulder pain. Where was that? And they grabbed the distal attachment of the levator scapula, where a lot of people get that really nasty fibrotic tension in that region. And he said that it's completely gone. So I started playing around. Needling the flexor carpi ulnaris reduces the tension in that proximal, in that distal area of the levator scapula within seconds. So what I invite you to do is to go ahead and cross fiber that levator scapula and you can feel how sinewy it is on a lot of people and it can be causing pain. Just get a pain scale one through 10 and ask the patient when you're rubbing on that, um, what is it, is it a six, is it an eight? Go down, needle the flexor carpi ulnaris and then go right back up to it and feel it. It should be reduced by 50%, maybe 75%. This is so consistent, people, that if it's not reduced substantially, you didn't get the right point. And the flexor carpi ulnaris motor entry point, you got to be spot on with this one. I think we have a video to show that, right? Brian, mm -hmm. is there anything yeah, you yeah. want to add or you, can we go I, right and... I, Just a little uh, interesting thing. Um, I, w I have these uh, series of books from a Western MD. I think his last name's Walton. It's been a while since I've seen these books. Really good atlases for for injuries. You know, they show some co cool little images that kind of help you memorize some of the the mechanism of injury and such. It's it's a good uh, good atlas. I'm pretty sure it's Dr. Walton is his name, but he's talking about ulnar nerve entrapment, and he makes a comment that that uh, statistically a lot of uh, people with ulnar nerve entrapment have uh, um, shoulder and neck pain, uh, which mm -hmm. we have no idea why, but it's just a just an observation. It was kind of interesting when I yeah, that's cool. When I saw that, yeah, it's like oh, maybe there's a reason why. <laughs> that's something else, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was basically like that. It's like, oh, go figure. <laughs> How about that, Doctor Walden? <laughs> All right, let's move, let's see the video, of Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> oh, whoops, that's right. It's Jeff's. Yeah, it's Jeff's thing. <laughs> Oop, wrong one. Be working. Right. On
I think it's the other one. Jeffrey? Yeah, it should say to... like motor point flexor carp balnearis maybe. Uh, yep, that's it. There we go. Yep, yep, thank you. We've identified the flexor carpi ulnaris out of A, B, and C. Which one's the most tender? A was the most tender to the patient. So I'm just going to identify that again. So in order to soften the levator scapula attachment, you have to be spot on with this. You can't be a quarter of an inch away or even an eighth of an inch of away. You have to really be spot on to that nerve innervation site. So my palpation hand, pressing the flexor carpi ulnaris against the bone. All right, so there was A. Right, and then we go slightly higher. There's B. Is it still A? That one there. Let's go a little bit lower. That one there. This one here. Pressing that against the bone. Now, needle through the flexor carpi ulnaris toward the bone, three quarters of an inch, one inch. There we go. We got a little fasciculation. Now, with that needle technique, you go right up to the distal attachment side of the levator scapula, and it should be softened substantially, and the patient will also tell you that that tension has reduced. In fact, many patients will say that you're not actually palpating as hard, but you're actually palpating a lot more than you were initially. So uh, please don't believe me. Go ahead and try this for yourself. It is a, an empirical motor point that softens this region. It works on the small intestine sinew channel. So there's something I want to, to talk about here is that that video and also this slide here, this is going to be in the motor points, uh, motor entry point for module four. There's over 50 muscles that we actually talk about and needle and show, but um, many of the many of the muscles will also have the motor entry point from Brian's and my cadaver dissections, and the reason why we have that well, because we're both anatomy geeks, but also <laughs> is for the acupuncturist to understand and appreciate where the collateral branch comes off of the primary branch. So here's the ulnar nerve that my right hand is pinching that ulnar nerve. And then the hemostats on the left is showing the collateral branch going in on the radial side of the flexor carpi ulnaris. So we can appreciate then if we went ahead and took that acupuncture needle and just touch superficially on that muscle, yes, we could get chi, but we know that that innervation is on the opposite side of the muscle. So if we do go in a bit deeper, three quarters of an inch to one inch, it'll be a marked change in that myofascial sinew channel. And this is the reason why that we put a lot of the motor entry points um, to show the acupuncturist the needle depth. So you could really appreciate where mm -hmm. we want to go with this. So what's All next? Right. Oh, we've got the myofascial release now tech. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so now, yeah, the separating Jing Jin Jeff video, please. We'll be working on the flexor carpi ulnaris, but also freeing the flexor carpi ulnaris and any adhesions between it and the ulna. So we'll be working a little bit on the muscle, but also in the groove between the muscle and the bone. Patient will start with ulnar deviation, and that'll just allow me to sink into that space. I'm gonna stretch and bring the tissue towards SI8 while they go into radial deviation. And back to ulnar deviation, that allows me to take the tissue a little bit more even. And then radial deviation. And again, maybe even this time, since I'm getting closer to the elbow, I might take her a little bit into elbow flexion. And right about there. All right, so Brian, do you want to add why we added that into this discussion? Yeah, so you, this would be a, a great technique. Uh, 
in addition, you know, maybe following the needling that you just saw for the flexor carpi ulnaris for uh, ulnar nerve entrapment, there's some, some more specific techniques we, we could add to that that we teach and uh, that Matt teaches in the um, assessment and treatment of the uh, injury class for this, this module for module four, which is on the upper extremities. Um, so that that's something, you know, so you can kind of put it in your uh, back pocket for that. Uh, really good supplement technique for that. But we also just put it in here as um, just because this muscle flexor carpi ulnaris is such an important structure for the uh, the tone in the small intestine sinew channel that you might consider this almost like you would needle, you know, like a distal point. Um, you, you could follow with this technique to help reduce and, and regulate tension in the whole channel. It's short technique, doesn't take but a couple seconds. So it's, it's really effective just to, to follow that, uh, that local needling. All right, cool. All right, so we're close to wrapping it up. Let's now go to uh, the local tissue of the levator scapula. So we're going from the flexor carpi ulnaris. We're going to skip the triceps. We're going to go all the way up into the levator scapula since we were talking about the flexor carpi ulnaris help. Mm -hmm. It helps to reduce that pain at the proximal attachment. So, um, so let's, let's talk about the two different motor points of the levator scapula. The one that we've been teaching for years is going to be Dija. Dija is going to be located just posterior to small intestine 16. It's innervated by of some collateral branches of the cervical plexus. Now, the lower motor point has been shown to be innervated by the dorsal scapula nerve. Um, in the motor entry point video recording that's going to be available in about six weeks or so, um, I talk about some very interesting research about how these um, cadaver researchers are actually looking at the levator scapula is actually innervated more by the cervical plexus than it is the dorsal scapular nerve. Now, if you look at your books, in your anatomy books or whatever, even if you just went into Google, what is the nerve innervation for the levator scapula? The dorsal scapular nerve always comes up. And it's really quite fascinating that these research papers are saying uh, you know, just about only about a third of their cadavers was it innervated by the dorsal scapular nerve. Um, the cadaver that Brian and I dissected was innervated by both, which I think that's probably happens quite a bit. So mm -hmm. Dija is going to be innervated uh, by the cervical plexus, and that's going to be where some of those slips are of the levator scapula, right? And then so this lower motor point innervated by the dorsal scapula, which is a, a branch coming from C5, goes right into that more of that muscle belly. So I think we've got another image to be able to show the needles, and then I think we can go into uh, myofascial technique mm -hmm. this. Yeah. Okay. So that upper needle is going perpendicular into Dijon. Um, a way that you can also propagate cheese, if you took it and started to direct that needle 10, 15, maybe 20 degrees, going slightly inferior to get a little bit more of the slips and that innervation. And you'll mm -hmm. see why I'm saying that. If you take a look at that cadaver video, you'll see how that's innervated by the cervical plexus comes up underneath the muscle. So we're trying to be able to see the best way of needling and try to propagate chi within that region. And then the lower needle, which is going to be innervated by that dorsal scapular nerve going more into the muscle belly, it's just underneath the lip of that upper trapezius and you mm -hmm. get quite a bit of chi within that region as well. So I think we can go into the myofascial technique here, B. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. And again, this would be a good follow-up to the, the needling, you know, not just you're not just putting needles in the levator scapula and calling it a day, full, full treatment uh, building. So maybe we do the acupuncturist assessment and find, of course, it's going to be pretty predictable for this one. Flexor carpi ulnaris uh, motor point would soften it. Personally, I know that one's uh, so predictable that I might not even do the acupuncture as an assessment unless I really wanted to, you know, wow the patient that way. But, um, but yeah, so flexor carpi ulnaris we could put in. Uh, whatever other constitutional points, uh, Dija and or the other motor point. Um, maybe look at the ilium and balancing the ilium because it's usually going to go with that elevated shoulder, that levator scapula is in spasm, maybe with a contralateral hip elevated on the other side. So there's a whole treatment we can, we can build, but we take those points out and then we can follow up uh, with that myofascial release technique for levator scapula to really help uh, return the muscle to a full length and uh, free any adhesions in that area. So I think that's uh, where we're going next. So let's look at that video. Do we have, we might've had a slide for that. Yeah, we do have a slide for that. I guess I should show that. Sorry, Jeff. Um, 
my fault on that one. I forgot we had a slide for that. So this just gives, uh, um, just keep it up here for a minute if you're going back and referencing it, it gives the sort of step by step, uh, but the video should show this too. So you'll see it in the video, but this is nice reference if you wanted to look at it later. So now I think we can go to the video. So this technique, we're gonna be working on the levator scapula. It's a pin and stretch technique. So I'm gonna access the levator scapula at around the nape of the neck. Take the person into a little bit of lateral flexion to the same side and a little bit of ipsilateral rotation. That allows me to sink into that space and access the tissue. From there, I'm gonna hold the tissue down, return the neck to a neutral position and start to take them into contralateral rotation and lateral flexion. Bringing the levator scapula, spreading the levator scapula down towards the superior angle of the scapula. So pace depends on the sensitivity of the patient. I can go a little bit faster or slower depending on what I'm trying to accomplish with it. So the combination of using abductor digiti minimi, flexor carpi ulnaris, treating the motor entry points with levator scapula, just those four needles followed by that myofascial release can really markedly change that posture that you observed mm -hmm. of an elevated scapula, possible cervical rotation or a lateral bend. So really quite useful. Um, something I want to reiterate that Brian just actually kind of touched upon is that this demonstration that we talked about, this webinar, was basically just the SI channel, right? But we are traditional acupuncturists. We have to be able to remember our Zong Fu differential diagnosis because it does make a difference to treat that patient constitutionally. So um, this is just one segment, obviously, but hopefully we gave you some tools to put in your back pocket. And uh, Brian, was there anything else you want to say or should we start taking some questions? Nope. Uh, here's some, just the last little... Uh... Thing, just some contact mm. info uh, for those who are wanting to ask about uh, the program. So we have the, the email and the webpage, www.sportsmedicineacupuncture.com. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been teaching all that since COVID. Uh, I've been teaching Tai Chi and Qigong for a long time, but I've been teaching some more medical kind of Qigong classes from a, a little bit of a Sydney channel perspective, biomechanical perspective also. Um, so there's a link for that um, to my blog, and it, you can follow that to find information for classes. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. YouTube, we have a, a pretty comprehensive channel, so there's a lot of good stuff on there. And Matt, you should have your book on here. I don't see it. Am I missing it? Maybe Jeff will say something about that. <laughs> I don't know. But before, can, can I can I say something? Are you done, Brian? Sure. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. I just wanted to go back to uh, treating the person constitutionally. Um, we've got. Uh, module one coming up June 26th and 27th of recording. That's going to be a live seminar on Net of Knowledge, and then the recordings will be on LASA OMS. Um, this is going to be discussing quite a bit the Watojaji points, spinal bends, treatment of the Zong Fu in a unique and different way. So it's something that if if you like to be able to think outside the box a little bit, and you like to be able to get your hands on the patient and do these kind of myofascial work, and you like our education, then that's something you might want to be able to check out. Um, that's going to be module one, the spinal column. And Jeffrey. All right, we, um, are we ready to get into some questions? Sure. All right, I'm just putting the link to your Sinew Channels website in there really quickly. Also, I just put a link to Matt's book, which is currently on sale for 15% off as part of our sports acupuncture sale. Wow. Um, also, check your emails after the webinar, and there is a discount for the online CEUs through Net of Knowledge. Um, but let's get into the questions really quick, because we actually have a bunch of them. Uh, first question, can the flexor carpi ulnaris and peroneal longus brevis relationship be used in the opposite way, i.e. to use the peroneal MPs to release the FCU? I'll give that a go. Try mm -hmm. both ways. And the word the word release is a little bit tricky with this one. It's almost like 
uh, getting them to communicate or, or opening or activating the communication with that because maybe the muscle is not necessarily needing a release. It might just be needing some activation. Um, so by all means, give that one a go. If somebody's having difficulty with ulnar deviation with something, try the peroneus longus motor point on the opposite side and see if that actually starts to help it a little bit. That's acupuncture as an assessment. Good question. Uh, next question. Does the work you do include any hologram needling on the scalp, ear, hand, first metacarpal, chest, etc.? Not that I know of. <laughs> I don't know. I used to actually do a lot of Korean hand acupuncture and use Magnus at one point, maybe five or six years during my practice was using that quite a bit. So the microcosms, no. However, if you use the microcosms in addition to the training that we have, gosh, you, that's just even a, as a very mm-hmm. powerful tool. Uh, it's an interesting thing is that uh, we get a lot of five elemental acupuncturists um, that are taking uh, the different trainings and and they don't they don't teach a lot of the anatomy or this kind of training at all and the people that actually learn our system in addition to the five elemental that combination is pretty profound because releasing a block in your five elemental acupuncture in addition to actually changing the chi and the posture viewed from TCM where they were teaching it is a very powerful combination. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, next question. Do you think doing orthopedic assessment on the opposite would work to address functioning of the affected side? On the opposite. I'm not sure if I'm following that. All right. Well, Rachel, if you can add any clarification. Sure, Matt. It, Maybe Matt did. Can yeah. I try something? Of course. If I'm understanding this correctly, let's say there is a painful arc on the unaffected side to affect the affected side. And maybe this is where she's going. There is about a 10% neurological crossover. For example, if somebody is going to be, let's say in a cast or they can't use their arm whatsoever, you're exercising the heck out of the opposite arm because there is a neurological transfer that goes over to that affected arm. And maybe that's what it was. All right, well, Rachel, if you wanna add another question in to kind of clarify, feel free. Um, We'll move on to the next one here. Um, Not to get off the SI subject, but assuming we can apply this to plantar fascia and posterior leg muscles too, could this help with plantar fasciitis? Sure. Could this help with plantar fasciitis? Mm -hmm. Um, The flexor carpi ulnaris and and the- No, I think they just mean the general uh, general approach and absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm assuming that's what they mean, you know, in terms of like using uh, points along the channel. the way the the sinew channels work um, in the posterior leg and foot, uh, we go. Geez, we we did a webinar on this. It seems like too. Um, I think on AAC, so you can maybe look for that one. But uh, the soleus, the deeper. Let's start superficial. The gastrocnemius, the more superficial of the posterior uh, leg, is part of the UB channel, UB sinew channel, and links higher up. Um, that tends to uh, not tends to that that connects more to the lateral calcaneus. If you followed those fibers into the, into the Achilles tendon or the calcaneal tendon, those would be more of the lateral attachment and into the abductor digiti uh, minimi of the, um, of the foot. So the lateral part of the foot, which is into the lateral part of the plantar fascia, the body of the plantar fascia where people usually have pain has more to do with the soleus, um, which is part of the kidney sinew channel, medial, attachment of the calcaneus into the plantar fascia, which is the main body of the plantar fascia on the foot. So you could consider things like soleus for sure and, and gastroc, but usually uh, pes planus is a big part of um, plantar fascia and being able to correct that is a little bit uh, m- more time to discuss um, and that would be part of this too. Matt, anything to add to that? Yeah, we did a quick webinar with the American Acupuncture Council mm-hmm. on pes planus. I mean, shoot, teaching this is usually three quarters of a day, plantar mm-hmm. fasciitis on the different things. There's a lot, lot to discuss with that. All right, next question. Would you use the SI you to treat psoas muscle pain? I saw that question. I was curious about the thought process on that. What part of the psoas? Uh, Marcia, it- if you'd like to add some clarification to the questions tab, uh, we can get back to that question towards the end. Um, 
Brian and I can be able to get, kind of talk about that a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah, I'd be curious so, to see. So the, that. so the internal psoas, the muscle belly itself, we associate that with kidney sinew channel, which makes a lot of sense, K kidney primary channel as well. The When it starts to come over the pubic ramus, where the iliopsoas fibers then come together, we're associating that with liver. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it could be small intestine and liver. So that common mm -hmm. anterior hip pain that some people will get, um, usually it's iliopsoas, but it could be pectineus, it could be sartorius, it could be tensor fossa lata. There's a number of different tissues there that can get injured. If it is iliopsoas and you're able to identify that with manual muscle testing and palpation, I could then see using flexor carpi ulnaris and abductor digitomenomy if that changes it, especially if the person's having any kind of digestive disturbances where the SI, a lot of the, the SI signs and symptoms are like spleen chi deficiency or spleen damp. So it would be interesting to be able to find out. I'm not exactly sure where in the, so as she was talking about the price, yeah, anything you want to add? Yeah, just to clarify, Matt said this, but I'm gonna say it a little different way too, just uh, for those who might not have uh, followed it. Um, the, uh, if you come up the liver sinew channel through the adductors, that would take you into the plane of the, the distal psoas. So it, it, it connects, uh, up that myofascial plane coming from the, the foot up into the groin region, up the liver sinew channel. But then as Matt mentioned, it, it kind of comes around the ramus and then dives. I'm kind of going backwards. He, he described it from the proximal part first, but then it dives, it dives deep into the body and really attaches to the spine blending in with the uh, uh, anterior longitudinal ligament and connecting with the uh, kidney sinew channel. So that's why we have it in, in both uh, both channels, topography, but also function and a whole bunch of uh, bunch of different uh, different reasons. Uh, so I agree with what Matt was saying with the uh, SI liver for the distal portion might be um, indicated, I guess. I could see, even though I wouldn't think this way clinically, but I wouldn't be uh, overly surprised if there's like a tai yang tai yin um, no, that would be Shaoyan. Never. I mean, a, a, a Taiyang Shaoyan uh, relationship through uh, SI and kidney, but I don't know. You know, I'd have to see it. I'd have to see how it plays out in clinic and and kind of what the other findings are for that. But that possible? Who knows? Clinically speaking, if it was iliopsoas strain, anterior hip pain, mm -hmm. but we did a manual muscle test, and there was six out of ten pain. I'm not sure I would go to flexor carpi ulnaris or abductor digitomenomy first. Mm -hmm. I would probably mm -hmm. do liver three, liver five. So source of luo point, mm -hmm. maybe liver six, add the she cleft point in, and then reperform the manual muscle test and see if that started to take pain away. Yeah, me too. I mean, you can always play around with this. You can leave liver three and liver five in and then put flexor carpi ulnaris in or abductor digitomenomy. And if it actually makes even a better result, then you know that you've got that midday, midnight correlation and you'll have to address other points on the small intestine and other points on the liver and also look and see what's the actual organ doing, right? So look into your Zong Fu differential diagnosis. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. I'm not sure if there's enough information. I did take note of the slide that you were on, if that's gonna help. Um, so this was around slide 10, um, but uh, they wanted to know, could you please explain a bit more about the motor points? Gosh, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, they, ra they raised our cutoff time to four hours, so. <laughs> <laughs> On the motor entry point module three recording that LASA OMS has right now, it has a number of different lower extremity injuries. For the first 20 minutes, 30 minutes, gosh, maybe 40 minutes, I go into a full discussion of motor points, the definition, how we're finding them um, and such. So that's actually gonna give, that's probably gonna answer your question a lot more than now. But the motor points, there are motor entry points and there's also intramuscular motor points where it's at the neuromuscular junction. So I'm gonna try to give you the abridged edition of this. Where the motor nerve actually comes in and travels and inserts into that muscle. This is where my research has been taking your acupuncture needle, a stainless steel needle into this highly conductive electrical area and observing the changes that can be made with this. So the motor entry point is something that I've been going 
go, been researching for the last 30 years or so in acupuncture with that. Now, once that nerve goes into the muscle from the motor entry point, it will usually bifurcate. It will go into a proximal branch and then a distal branch. In fact, those branches, they start to become so thin, it's almost hair-like, where it's actually really kind of difficult to follow it. And we've actually tried that to be able to see how far that nerve goes intramuscular. So we're, we're opening up the muscle to watch its trajectory. Now, where that muscle goes, where that nerve then follows in, and it attaches to certain neuromuscular junctions, those are also motor points. Those are going to be motor, uh, intramuscular motor points. I'm innervated by a more of a smaller diameter nerve. Um, from my experience, taking your acupuncture needle and going into the larger diameter motor entry points then affects the entire muscle and the, and the entire myofascial sinew channel as well. Brian, do you want to say anything with that? Or? No, I think that was great. Are you guys okay with a couple more questions? Sure. sure. All right. Um, this, I think, was in response to the video that you guys, the first video that you had shown. Um, she asked, did you go into the tendon with the needle? First video. The first video. No. Um, the first video was the force transmission one. Oh, then it must have been the yeah. second. No, I think that probably oh. was the that probably okay. was the video. No, 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 it was the oh. um, I was I was trying to make sure I was answering the right video. Um, first of all, let me say this isn't an answer to the question that that wasn't demonstrating a technique. Though we do sometimes wrap the fibers around, but with a cadaver specimen, our goal wasn't to show a technique. Our goal was to show force transmission. So the amount of force to really get those fibers caught onto the needle and the pulling was more aggressive than, than you would do with a patient. And, and it wasn't, the goal wasn't to show a technique. The, the goal was to show how that force transmission for those muscles, you could even see the fibers of the flexor carpi ulnaris on the ulnar head, how they had the same fiber direction as the anconius and how that um, force transmitted from one needle to the next. So that was not an answer to the question. That was just a, just a caveat that that, that 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 was a different purpose than showing a technique. I really glad um, you said that, yeah, yeah, I meant to say it during the time, and it kind of slipped my mind. Um, but uh, the the if I remember correctly, the um, Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. Is those were both in the motor points themselves. It might not have been flexor carpi ulnaris. It seems like it might have been a little higher, but it was in the muscle itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we so clinically, based on what our research, if you stimulated flexor carpi ulnaris motor point and the anconius. Those are going to be two points that are communicating with each other, signaling mm -hmm. along that small intestine sinew channel. So a very useful combination, especially with abductor digitomenomy for lateral elbow pain or also medial elbow pain. With anything that's going to be affecting that small intestine sinew channel mm -hmm. because the anconius is more on that Sanjiao channel. Depends on where that pain is going to end up being. But just remember that point combination can be really quite useful to continue the communication of that SI sinew channel. Yeah, and just getting chi would have that same force transmission. It's just not going to be as obvious. You're not going to necessarily see the the needle um, be able to move. But if you're if you're affecting the tone of one of those muscles, then you're you're having an effect through that that communication through the whole channel. That was what we were trying to show. We were just showing it more, um, a little bit more uh, visual, you know, <laughs> to where you could see that that force transmission. Though though there are techniques where we do wrap the needle around and, and pull, but it would be um, a little more mindful of comfort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like for example, opening up the cubic tunnel when there's an entrapment. Mm -hmm. um, we're using those kind of needle techniques a lot with nerve entrapments. Um, this is something that we teach in the SMAC program. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of videos demonstrating that, I think on cadavers, where you can actually see the cubic tunnel opening up. So it's helping mm -hmm. to decompress that nerve which really works great by doing that. And then you follow that with a myofascial release technique. Mm -hmm. It's really quite useful. Do you guys have any insights for muscle tension dysphonia? Mm -hmm. Man, I have not gotten any success with that. Yeah. It's like a putting a bandaid on it. It's temporary relief. Um, this is something where I think you need to not only use acupuncture, but you got to get into a lot of diet, nutrition, Chinese herbs. It's, it's, it's not, it's not within my wheelhouse, that one. I do think a big part of the picture though, is, is correcting the posture and getting the head forward posture, I think would be whether it is enough to solve it, it would be part of the picture. There's a big internal component with that though. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Big one. So this is where you have to really get into a lot of Chinese herbs and diet and also even, even the emotional aspect of it. Mm -hmm. 
Well, let's do one more question, if that's okay with you guys. Sure. All right. So are we saying the deeper needling or the MP of flexor carpi ulnaris will affect the tissue in the groove between the ulnaris and the muscle tissue, kind of like a, kind of like a through needle? Hmm. Ryan, you want to start on that one first? Uh, actually, I want to hear it again because I saw a question that I was maybe going to answer also, <laughs> um, and I got distracted. I'm sorry. Can I hear? Um, that? So, are we saying the deeper needling or the MP of the flexor carpi ulnaris will affect the tissue in the groove between the ulnaris and the muscle tissue? Yes, in addition to the entire myofascial mm -hmm. chain. Yes, it will affect the tissue of the flexor carpi ulnaris and the space between the flexor carpi ulnaris and the ulna, that myofascial tissue, in addition to the entire chain. Yeah. But you're not trying, your, your target isn't that going through yeah. the muscle into the, into the groove between. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Brian, you said you wanted to answer a question? Yeah, I just started looking at the, the does, uh, does the sinew channel go up into the jaw and would flexor carpi help with TMJ? Uh, it does go, uh, SI channel does, uh, at least the way we have it uh, assessed and analyzed here into some of the area of the face, but it wouldn't be my go-to for jaw issues. I would think more of the large intestine sinew channel, which uh, goes uh, into the pterygoids you know, kind of like almost opposite uh, of the stomach channel. So the stomach channel also would be in, involved with that, but then the large intestine channel going more to the deep stomach portion. I mean, by that, I mean, on the other side of the, the um, mandible and um, into the pterygoids, like you can get to through stomach seven, if you needle that deeply, you'd get to the lateral pterygoids, or you could go um, uh, kind of deep uh, into the medial pterygoids uh, underneath the mandible. Um, so I feel like that's where the large intestine sinew channel goes. And then from there, it binds to the nose, probably. In this case, it would be binding to the sphenoid bone. Um, so those would be more of the, the go-tos that I would be thinking of. Um, and for TMJ, I often find that uh, the low connecting point of the uh, large intestine channel becomes very sensitive, sometimes on the contralateral side, sometimes same side. So stomach and large intestine, gallbladder would be another one to consider. Matt, I don't know if you have any... Any uh, thoughts was, on that? I was going with the large intestine and the pterygoids mm -hmm. for that one. Those are the ones I find most predictably do it. So SI, not so much. So it does go up into that region, but not as much of a TMJ type uh, connection. Um, earlier, I saw a question about if there's going to be any notes involved with this. So yeah, Jeff, what I'll do is I'll, I'll develop some notes real quick and I'll shoot them over to you. Perfect. I'll share them on okay. the blog with the recording. All right, can I get those to you tomorrow or do you need those tonight? No, tomorrow's fine. Okay, perfect. Um, well, I think that is it for the evening. So I cannot thank you guys enough. I have to say, even as a non-acupuncturist, I always feel a little smarter after sitting on a class <laughs> with you guys. So I do appreciate that very much. And I know everyone in attendance did too. Um, please check your email five minutes after we end. There is a promo code in there. There's some uh, links. There's some other upcoming webinars we'd like to share with you. On Thursday, we're going to be hosting Dr. Rekha Lund for a webinar called Spring Clean Your Liver, so fairly timely topic. Uh, please attend. Um, please check out the Sports Medicine Acupuncture Certification Program on Net of Knowledge. So those are online CEUs. They can be taken anywhere at any time. Um, Matt and Brian, you guys are great. It's always fun working together. I hope we get to do another one soon. And I hope everybody has a great evening. Thank you, everybody. Jeff, yeah, you're thank awesome. You. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Jeff. Have a great okay. one. Okay, bye.